Welcome to episode 204 of the Formula One Grid Talk podcast. Today we're here to discuss and review all of the action from the 2022 Azerbaijan Grand Prix. My name is Ruby Price and joining me we have Sophia Richmond and Tom Downey from Everything F1. Hi. Hello. Nice to have you back again this weekend. Uh, and Jawad Yakub from uh, the Hit the Apex podcast. Hey. Hello. Uh, but first, if you enjoy this podcast, we'd love it if you could take five to leave us a five star rating on Spotify or a five star review on Apple Podcasts. If you do, you'll automatically go into our monthly draw to win a Grid Talk t shirt from our champion range of merch. And if you're one of the 69% of people who aren't yet subscribed to the channel, please consider helping us out with a like and a subscribe. So it was maximum points for Red Bull and maximum disappointment for Ferrari as Verstappen finished a comfortable 45 seconds ahead of Mercedes' George Russell, who ended up in a surprise P3 after the double DNF for the Ferraris. Tom, he started P3 and finished 20 seconds ahead of his teammate, but did Max Verstappen ever not look like winning today's race? Uh, No. As soon as he passed Perez... Um, and then the threat of both the Ferraris was gone. Well, the threat of the Claire was gone because I don't think Sainz was ever really going to be there. Um, as soon as Max went off into the lead, he pulled like a two and a half, three second gap within the, within the first lap that he'd overtaken Perez. And then as, as soon as you know, as soon as, soon as the Claire's engine went bang, that was it. He was he was just way out in the lead. He was just. He was just he was doing like a Hamilton drive from like 2017 to 2020, one of those years, where he just sailed off into the lead, checked out, turned the engine down. Um, a bit like in the second Silverstone race, uh, you know, I think in 2020, where he took the lead and just fuck it off, basically. Um, yeah, Perez didn't really have the pace to catch him, which I'm sure you know we'll talk about Perez separately, but yeah, Max is just it, it was it was a champion's drive, if you like, and that's not and you know that's not me trying to make a pun, but it really was a driver of someone who is like, have you forgotten about me in this championship? Because there's been a lot of talk around Perez recently, and rightly so. But I think I think today was also Max saying, I like you know just listen listen you know um, I'm the reigning champion, I am leading the world championship. Don't you dare write me off at the expense of my, you know. Don't you dare write me off in favor of my teammate just yet. So yeah, it was a, it was just it was a really really controlled race uh, for for Max today. Yeah, absolutely. A lot of people calling it mature, and you know, like a driver who kind of just firmly had his head bolted onto his neck, um, which some drivers may need if uh, a certain amount of bouncing continues at some point. But Sophia. Um, Max's teammate, Sergio Perez, started second, finished second, was leading the race after turn one, after getting his elbows out at the beginning, which almost weren't really needed based on um, the lockup from Charles Leclerc. Um, there was a bit of team orders at play, but ultimately, like it just looked like Max had the pace to just comfortably you know, stay ahead of Perez today. Yeah, 100%. Obviously, on the team radio, it said no fighting. Even um, Perez in the post-race uh, interview pretty much said Max was just way better than him in the race, and it just made sense um, letting Max kind of lead the way and let that gap go. But the difference between the two drivers in finish times as well is quite a big gap. Obviously, with Baku, you never know what's going to happen. You never know <laughs> what happens around the corners, so to speak. So... The fact that they got a really large lead, obviously some of it went down to the types of safety cars with the pit stop strategies, a lot of slow pit stops from a lot of the teams as well, not just one team in particular. Um, that kind of all played into effect for both the Red Bulls to have the one-two. And then obviously Perez designed to push, I think, on the 49th lap to take the fastest lap over Max because Max originally was having the fastest lap at that time. It's, it's a amazing day for Red Bull and it's what they needed to keep the league going prove that they're still the winners of last year uh, as a driver and close for it as constructors I think Perez should be buzzing still he's still on a high for Monaco he's re-signed with Red Bull till 2024 and he did what he was meant to do he didn't have any accidents he didn't cause any issues just kept his head down and delivered what is technically a second driver's racing job to do 
Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, now he's P2 in the championship, which, you know, is exactly what Red Bull want. It definitely puts them in a better position for, you know, the Constructors' Championship. Having Perez P2 also, you know, just allows them to be a bit more less focused on one particular driver, which, you know, depending on who you talk to in Red Bull, um, may or may not be the idea of the team. But, you know, Checo did sign as what was quite visibly a driver number two. And a driver who is absolutely not really a number two at the minute, Gerard, um, George Russell, P3. Obviously, two DNFs ahead of him after he started P5. But this is another podium for a team that, you know, look so far off the pace that they finished 45 seconds behind the winner today. And yet they're like 30, within 38 points of um, Ferrari in the Constructors' Championship now, which is pretty exciting considering uh, coming after the first few races, Mercedes did not look like they were going to be anywhere near that, but just, you know, being able to be consistent. And a lot of it has been down to Mr. Consistent or Mr. Sunday, as he's now known in George Russell. So picking up another podium is third of the season and then keeping that awesome run of top five finishes going. The only driver who has done that this season, um, it's really hard to fault him at the moment. And the sad part about it is that it was for the large part, another lonely drive for him. Like he's had all year so far. So he hasn't really had the chance to, you know, go wheel to wheel with any of the Red Bulls or, or the Ferraris. But the fact that, you know, he's there in the right place at the right time, he's hoovering up the points and, you know, he's not far behind Leclerc either in the championship either. Not saying, you know, it'll happen soon, but if they're still there, if Russell's still there um, come the pointy end, then sure, you know, he could possibly finish ahead of the Ferrari driver and Mercedes as well as a team looking to, claim an unlikely second in the championship but there's still a long way to go yeah absolutely and um you know no one should be writing anyone really off at this point if you're you know not in the top three teams um but also in the top three team tom lewis hamilton ended up finishing fourth today um complaining about his back which having looked at some of the onboards and stuff i'm not surprised um had to make some very elbows out passes past, you know, Ocon, um, some easy passes against, you know, the likes of Sonoda. But ultimately, you know, what was your take on Lewis's race today? Uh, I think it was one of his best races of the season, um, aside from Spain. Uh, it, 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 it was, for, for Hamilton in 2022, it was one of his best races. It says a lot about where Mercedes are that we're calling this one of his best races. That you know that that, that the Mercs have finished. Yeah, yeah, P three and P four, good result for them. Got a bit lucky with the Ferrari DNS, but in F one, you 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 take the opportunities when they come. You know, you know. So you know, they're not going to complain about it. Obviously not. Um, yeah, Lewis just looked in pain. Um, and seeing the onboards of that of the um of the Merc, you know, oscillating down the down that long straight, my God, I feel for you know, as everybody knows I'm not a Hamilton fan, but you know, in case I can guess. Um, but um, you know, but but you know, watching that car, the way it was bouncing and you you know, it's like fidgeting and it it, it it reminded me of when you put, you know, when you see like cartoons where they've got like a piece of brick on either side of like a piece of plywood and it flexes like that. Hopefully that makes sense. And to our audio listeners, I just made a really weird gesture with my hands and to our video list, to our video watchers, I can only apologize. Um, but, um, but, but, you know, it's just, it's just a, the way the car was just, you know, just bouncing and flexing all, all over the place. Um, I'm not surprised that, that he was in pain and, you know, we saw him getting out of the car. He, you know, I, you know, he probably had his adrenaline floating around his body like no tomorrow, and then when that all wore off, the pain probably set in. Um, I fear for him next week as Canada, similar kind of circuit. We got some long straights down there. You know, you know, he's gonna, it's not gonna get any easier for him. Um, it, but, it, but in terms of his result today, yeah, it, it was a good result. Um, I thought he was going to get stuck behind, but Ocon. 
Um, and for a little while, it appeared like he did, you know, like Monaco 2022 flashbacks intensify. But um, but no, he managed to, um, he, he put in a pretty damn good move. You know, he just been really late on the breaks. Basically said to Ocon, look, hun, you're either in the wall or you get behind me. And, you know, it was hard racing, but it was good racing. That's what we want to see. Um, yeah, I was impressed with Hamilton. And I noticed he got driver of the day as well, um, which I've got to be, I, I think, I think was deserved. Because um, I know Max went from P3 to P1, but Hamilton got the Merc, which is a bit of a dog this year, from P7, I think, to P4. So, yeah, um, a good day at the office for him. Yeah, and also had to make quite a few overtakes as well, just to, you know, solidify that P4. Sophia, on to Pierre Gasly then. Back at the end of the grid where he should be. Um, you know, he's finished P5. A very strong performance, just, you know, got to keep putting in the lap times to stay ahead of the people behind him. And other than Lewis Hamilton, who obviously managed to get ahead of him, I think he's managed to keep everyone else behind him. Yeah, definitely. He is actually one of the few drivers that only had a single pit. He pitted, um, I think, with 40 laps to go as well. So the fact that he had tire management was great. This is what I've said on this podcast and also like on the Everything F1 podcast. This was kind of where we needed to see Gasly turn it, turn it around. He's not, he's now, I think, above his teammate by, or just close, even maybe equal to his teammate Yuki on points. This is where we want to see him driving like how he was last season. Like he's not had the best first seven races. We can all attest to that. This is the Gazi that we have seen last year, and we're so excited to see him back. Obviously, it's not like podium like last year, but it's close enough given that a lot of the troubles that he has. Alpha Tori was just a mixed bag in general, <laughs> um, this race, which we'll probably talk about Yuki in a bit. But for Gazi, like the fact that he defended when he could against Hamilton, it was just his tires and the fact that he was tire age from Hamilton to um Gasly as well played a key part so again going back the fact that he was one of the few drivers that was only single pitted and went that long and to finish in top five that's a great feat to have um other than that he was quite quiet throughout the race there wasn't that much conversation it was only when Hamilton was trying to battle with him that happened when it was Alonso as well it was just a weird mid-team battle for most of the race that a lot of the coverage was kind of focusing on once the Ferraris had the double DNFs but definitely the points needed for Alvatore really happy that Gazi I hope is back we'll see how it is in Canada it's been a couple years away from that so and it's a maybe not the it's it might be a good track for them we'll see but I'm, I'm really excited yeah, absolutely. Very excited to be returning to Canada next weekend. Um, and I look forward to seeing all of the response on the Grid Talk podcast from that little bit of a cheeky plug during your own podcast. Anyway, Joad, um, Sebastian Vettel, very strong showing from him today for the most part. Um, finish coming back, coming home P6. Um, obviously, we saw the unfortunate attempt to pass. Was it Ocon? Yeah, I think it was Ocon um, and going on but managing to basically, it looked like he basically lost about six seconds, which um, when he finished seven seconds behind Pierre Gasly, Seb Vettel could have maybe even been fighting with Lewis and Gasly, you know, in this race. Um, But either way, it's still a strong showing from the German today. Yeah, and again, he seems to have a real knack at getting results in Baku, I think ever since um, Formula One's been going to Azerbaijan. He hasn't finished lower than, well, sixth today was his worst result at this track. So when that's, you know, your worst result currently in a car, which, you know, to get sixth in that Aston Martin is like, wow, that's pretty amazing. So good on him again for getting a good result um, for the team there. Like you said, uh, he had that little moment um, when fighting with Ocon early in the race and went off at turn three, um, but lucky he was able to get back going again. Uh, He was one of those drivers who pitted uh, when the first virtual safety car came out for Carlos Sainz. So it was all very questionable back then whether um, if they would do a one-stop strategy, would they make it to the end of the race or not? But, you know, with the likes of Hamilton and, and co making that second stop, I don't think he would have been able to get up to behind the Mercedes. But, 
you know, that time lost to Gasly might prove to be of, uh, you know, the difference between fifth and sixth today, but he was fine in sixth. Alonso behind was doing his own thing and, you know, kept the McLarens at bay as well. So I think given that this is Aston Martin's best result of the season and, the fact that Vettel goes very well around here, I think, you know, it's positive for the team, but I don't think it's by any step of imagination that uh, it's like a change of fortunes for the team. They're still pretty terrible with where they're at at the moment, but I'm happy to see Seb get some good results though. Yeah. I mean, you need only look at like the performance of his teammate throughout the season to see where Aston Martin sort of really are, but you know, you've got to find like the average between the two of them. Um, but Tom, uh, Fernando Alonso finishing P7, doing, you know, what Fernando Alonso does best, some FAQs, um, keeping all the cars behind and stuff. Um, do you think that, like, this is kind of where Alpine are at the minute, where it's just a matter of, all right, cool, let's keep cars behind? Or do you think Al- Alpine should really be aiming further up the grid? Uh, I think Alpine could be aiming for further the grid. Whether they should is a different question. I, I, as, as daft as that sounds, I think there's definitely within that car, within that team, I think there's definitely scope for them to move up the grid, as Alonso has showed. Um, you know, I, I know his sort of like out and out performances on paper may not look it, but if you look at some of his qualifying that he's had or that he's almost had. So it's like, you know, he, I, I think he was going to put it on the front row in Australia last month or, or the month before now, or was it a month before? I don't know, whatever it was. Uh, it's all a blur. Um, but, and and again, to, you know, I, I know, I, you know, I, I, I know um, he went out in, in, he did go out in QT yesterday, didn't he? I, I'm, sure, I'm sure he started, was it P13? Was he behind? Or am I getting that wrong? P10. Oh, was he P10? It, Oh no, Ocon was P13. Sorry, um, sorry, uh, got my Alpines confused. Uh, yeah, but um, but I, I don't, I, I don't think P, a P10 start was a true representation of what that car can do, because we saw, um, because you know, we we saw today how difficult that Alpine is to pass. And I know, you know, I, I know last time out in in Monaco, um, Ocon was taken over the the. Um, uh, it was taken over the safety car duties, um, but um, and today it looked like you know both uh, um, uh, you know sorry Alonso, that joke failed. Um, you know, um, Delpings are, are a hard car to pass. It, it seems, and they do seem to have good shove down the straights. My big concern about them is their reliability. Um, we've seen them already go bang a few times. And Alonso is already knocking on the door of a, I think he's knocking on the door of an IC penalty. Um, and we're what, just over a third of the way into the season? That's not going to bode well later on down the line. Um, so uh, th- they could be fur- further up the field. Um, and Alonso is, you know, I was very skeptical, skeptical of him coming back to F1 because I thought, oh, you know, I thought, you know, Somebody else should have a go in the seat. You, you, you know, you know the you know, scope for Piastri to be in that seat, or you know, maybe Joe Guan Yu before he went to Sauber or whatever they're called. Um, and um, and Alonso has completely proved me wrong. You know, he's had some real good ding dongs this year and last year. Obviously, he had some he had some good battles. So Al- Alpine could be further up the field. I think they really could be. I think if you were to take their pure pace, I think they'd have been disappointed today that they weren't closer to the Mercs and that they weren't, like, say, P4 and P6 or P4 and P7. I think they'll be a bit miffed that they couldn't have at least split the Mercs with them, um, with, with Alon- with, uh, yeah, with Alonso. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Fernando Alonso is used to picking up um, engine penalties. He picked up hundreds of them, I think it was, when he was with McLaren last time around. Um, you know, just when you start having to deal with, like, 60-place grid drops, that's when it just gets confusing. And I think that's why they stopped doing something along those lines for grid penalties. But um, Sophia, Daniel Ricardo, P8 in the lead McLaren car. Um, ultimately, McLaren had team orders going on a lot today. 
Uh, first time around, it was Daniel Ricciardo being told to hold station behind Lando and Norris so that Lando could not um, pit ahead of Alonso. And then second time around, it was Norris being told to hold station behind Daniel Ricciardo. Um, were McLaren right to use team orders today? And do you think, um, you know, had they not used team orders uh, in the first place, could Daniel Ricciardo maybe have even finished ahead of Alonso today? Um, I don't know. I don't think so. potentially because if you look at because Daniel Ricardo as well was very similar to Gazi with pitch strategy going quite long, just opposite ways. Um, it was it was a good day for McLaren as a whole. Um, I will say that it's a great day for Ricardo, similar to again Gasly. It's what we need. It's that shift now that we want to kind of see this more consistently from Daniel with. The calls in the beginning, I think it was probably because obviously they were both on two different tires. So there was two different strategies kind of coming into play with that. And yes, Ricardo did want to overtake um, Norris in the beginning because he felt like he had a lot quicker pace. He did have a lot of quicker pace, but they were just asking just to fall back just a little bit for the support for Lando. And they kind of reciprocated it in the second half. Mind you, Lando was not happy and even tried to in the last couple of uh, so, uh, DRS zones and uh, corners trying to almost overtake Ricardo by the looks of it. Um, I think it's difficult to say because how we could hear it on the radio, we could see, we could hear that Daniel was like, eh, rather not, but okay, I'm going to do what's best for the team. And then you have the opposite of Lando kind of being like, no, like it was a weird kind of vibe, but. With Daniel, I think he could have maybe gone a little bit higher. I think if he pushed a couple laps earlier towards the end, I think he could have reached Alonso. But the minute that McLaren radioed saying we're staying as it is and kind of was like Alonso was too quick, they were about a minute and 1.4 seconds different. So we've seen bigger gaps and overtaking Gasly and Hamilton, um, Yuki a few times, Vettel, like, Alonso even. So we've had that happen already in this race. I think Daniel should have pushed a lot sooner and maybe we could have seen him overtake and probably move up a bit. But yeah, I mean, team orders, it's good. It's a good for win for McLaren as a whole. Good for Danny. I don't think it's good for Lando. Yeah. And Joe, uh, the opposite side of that question, uh, Lando Norris obviously finishing P9. Um What's your take on the situation? Were McLaren right to use team orders? And, you know, do you think Lando Norris could have finished ahead of Fernando Alonso had they not kept him behind Daniel Ricciardo at the end of the race? Yeah, um, in hindsight, maybe if they had done it a bit earlier, then perhaps he could have been able to. Um, It was just a bit disappointing that putting uh, Dan on mediums didn't pay off you know you would have thought that it would have been the quicker tire at the end there especially with everyone on hards and on on older hard tires as well so um and then yeah Lando getting quite frustrated towards the end to the point where he tried to uh get past him before the finish line on the final lap uh yeah I think overall it's actually good that they were able to score the points that they did um it was a bit depressing when in the early phase of the race, they said, oh, you know, stay behind or we've got to keep you in this position um, because we're trying to get Lando to overcut Alonso, which didn't happen when they did bring Lando in. He was quite a while off Alonso. And then at that point, he was behind the likes of Stroll and Bottas and some other slower cars and it took a while for him to get back up. And I think the retirements ahead, uh, especially for the Ferraris, would have helped him get back in the points. Um, Ricardo's strategy was definitely the one to score points, but just the circumstances in the race definitely ha- helped Lando to get back to inside the points. And yeah, you know, a double points finish for McLaren this season has been quite rare. And as much as you've got the other guy struggling in the car for confidence and perhaps can't, you know, push like if Lord Norris was in that position to push ahead and catch Alonso, he might have done it. But, you know, because Ricardo is struggling with his own issues uh i guess you know just for the sake of the team they had to just hold station and get the points that uh they could today 
Yeah, absolutely. And Tom, back to you for the second Alpine um, on the uh, track today. Esteban Ocon, P10, last of the unlapped runners, last of the point scorers. Um, you know, put up a stout defence against the Mercedes, against the Aston Martins, and I think against... Um, was it against anyone else? I don't know. Um, but yeah, uh, what was your take on Esteban Ocon's race today? Uh, again, I thought Ocon had a pretty um, had a yeah had had a pretty good weekend, um, and indeed a pretty good Sunday. Um, you know, he started outside the points, finished in you know finished or you know or be a point, but he still finished in the points. Um, you know, maybe that position was was a little bit sort of artificially inflated by the DNFs around him, um, but. But he seems to be running a good race. You know, he was putting up a pretty staunch defence of Hamilton for a while, until Hamilton, you know, got the better of him and then, you know, sort of yeeted off into the distance. Um, yeah, I mean, I don't recall seeing an awful lot of Ocon aside from his defending or his battling with Hamilton. Um, but you know, but he 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 was having a he was having a pretty good Sunday to be fair. Um, I think he'll be pleased getting the points, especially after he didn't make it into Q three. Um, you know, I, I think I think in, in any driver's book that's a you know that's a relative success. So he, uh, yeah, it, it wasn't a bad day at the office for him. I mean, you, you know, you could always say that it, it could have been better, but he was um, he still got a point for Alpine. Um, you know, that's gonna, you know that's going to boost himself, going to boost the team. He was putting in some good defensive moves on some pretty worn tires as well. Um, and when you've got the driver sort of coming up behind you sniffing for an overtake you're going to be a bit sort of like oh anyway but when you realize it's one of the biggest names the sport has ever seen regardless of how sort of questionable their car is this year you're still going to be thinking Plymouth is Hamilton um he's going to send it up the inside or he's going to do this or he's going to do that or whatever so yeah it, 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 a, a decent showing from him um if I was him I would just be looking over my shoulder a little bit at people like Pierre Gasly, who are probably going to be looking for a different seat. I mean, Ocon does have a contract, I think, up until 2024. But I just had a contract with Racing Point. That is true. Um, yeah. Sophia, uh, Valtteri Bottas, P11, first of the Ferrari-powered cars to finish. Um, one of the few Ferrari-powered cars to finish, actually. Um but yeah, it was a very quiet one from Valtteri Bottas today. You didn't really see much of him, but um, you know, finishing P11, that'll be disappointing for Valtteri given, you know, some of the results that we've seen from the driver this season. Yeah, I mean, there wasn't many Ferrari engines left on the grid towards the end anyway, um, given that there was four DNFs from that. I don't know. So it was very quiet, as you mentioned. There was barely any coverage. The only time I kind of was looking at Bottas was when um, Zhou Guan Yu had to DNF for his engine problem. But it was looking like his teammate was actually going to out finish higher than um, Bottas, which was quite interesting to see. But, I mean, I can't really say much. It was just such a quiet race. Like, I didn't see him in any battles. Like, he just kind of, it's just a head down, finish a race. Obviously, as you mentioned, again, P11, it's not ideal for what he's been doing the last couple of races, like finishing quite high in the points, having 41 points this season so far. But I don't know. It, it, I There could have been probably maybe, I think he had a slow pit as well, which could have maybe had some effect into um, where he finished on the grid. But there was a lot of battling between him and like whoever uh, the people in like P10, P9, and P12. So a lot of it was like Kevin Magnuson. Alonso was into the mix as well for a bit before Alonso kind of shot up. Um, but yeah, I, there wasn't that much. It was just a quiet race for him. Um, ideally, it would have been nice to see him in the points, but yeah, um, unluckily for the Ferrari train. So it's um, engine. So it's going to be interesting what see what's going to happen in Canada. I hope he can probably pick it up and make some points to recover from how it was this weekend. Yeah, I I put it down to the look of the special livery. Um, you know, as soon as you're running a special livery, you never do, you never have a great weekend unless your name's Red Bull and you're in Turkey. Um, 
it's like cars all over again in the movie like flashbacks of <laughs> that movie with the colors and everything for it yeah absolutely Joad, um alex albon p12 um was obviously very disappointed yesterday to not make it into q2 because of some antics he blamed on fernando alonso um but you know we it's mostly bolstered by the cars ahead that have you know re- dnf'd but i think a p12 for him in a williams that was very much not competitive this weekend isn't the worst thing in the world no, not at all. And he made a good start as well, made up a couple of places. Then he lost a place to Kevin Magnussen, went on, pitted early with the first virtual safety car, then uh, made the second stop as well and kind of was helped, like you say, by those retirements ahead. And then uh, with the driver who finished behind him, Yuki Sonoda as well, having his problems um, later in the race kind of helped Albin go up to 12th. So it kind of you know looks good when you look at the circumstances of the race and of course where Williams are as well competitively at the moment and his teammate as well here the way his race panned out so a not so embarrassing uh, look for the team um, but you know we know that Albon can do better in that car we've seen him score points this season but um, yeah kind of like you know it just when if this was going to be one of those bonkers Baku races, of course, you know, you would expect Williams to be in the points or you would predict Williams to be in the points. But overall, uh, this season, Baku was quite tame. So um, that's kind of where you would have expected Alwyn to come. Yeah, it would have certainly been shocking if, given the race that we had, uh, Williams had finished in the points. Um, and Tom, a driver who you know, was on for, you know, a decent chunk of points. Yuki Tsunoda before his rear wing started looking a bit like Two-Face from Batman. Um, First of all, he got the black and orange flag for, you know, the incident with his rear wing. They gaffer taped it up and sent him back out. And a lot of us were kind of surprised that that was still, that was, that was fine. Um, Do you expect to hear anything from the FIA on what's happened and do you think you know, where would you how do you think Yuki Tsunoda's race would have actually gone had the issue not happened in itself um well I've just checked the FIA website there's nothing there yet um I would be very surprised if we don't hear anything further about this because safety is absolutely paramount in F1 and that rear wing was not stable and all Alpha Tari did by gaffer taping it rather ham-fistedly was just applying more pressure and probably broke the thing. Um, he, Sonoda was having a good day at the office. You know, he, he was putting in some good moves. Both the Alpha Tarries were doing pretty damn well today. And, you know, it was a shame that his race was ultimately brought down by, you know, by, you know, by a broken wing like this. But, Imagine if that gaffer tape had failed. We're lucky it didn't. And we're lucky that nothing flew off. But imagine if that would have failed and hit a car or, you know, imagine if it had flown off and caused a puncture or a piece like that, the halo isn't going to stop that because it's still fundamentally an open cockpit. So imagine if that would have gone under a halo or, you know, even skimmed over the top of a halo and hit a driver or something. I'm amazed that the FAA didn't black flag him. Um, I get that it's a race and the team wanted to keep Snowden out. They wanted to keep him going. I fully get that. You know, you know, they're not there to just roll over and say, oh, okay, no problem. You know, they're going to want to try and get him out. But the, f- the fundamental structure of the wing was broken. Um, you, you know, it was missing the mechanism on one side, which which had apparently come off. That's why it was only opening on half, you know, half the side of the wing. And I know that tape like that is immensely strong, but I mean, you know, it's it's just a safety thing, and and they should have just pitted him and said, you know, sorry, with reliability, you know, you know, it sooner wouldn't have been happy. And understandably so, but 
Im- but you know, imagine if if it would have come flying off somewhere around the track, and then and then next thing you know, we've got a you know we've got a big we've got a big incident, and then the team's getting you know really hammered for doing that. I wonder if we're going to see a directive, or if we're going to see a post race something or other for for Alpha Tari, or or even if it's um, you know you know, or even if we just see a, a directive for all the teams that it's like that you cannot use them in. Uh, duct tape to to tape up a rear wing. It's like it, it's 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 not good enough from a safety perspective, because it's one thing to you know it's it's one thing to to duct tape something at home or, or you know something like that. It's another thing to do it on the back of a blimmin' racing car, and it's not like it's Formula Ford. It's Formula One. So you know just. The FIA didn't look too happy anyway because you know, because Crofty was wailing about something when 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 they were pissing um, and and they were doing this that apparently an, an FIA representative went stomping over to um, Alpha Tauri. So I wonder if we're going to hear something else. I'd be surprised if we don't. Um, obviously, we'll keep everybody updated if we do. Um, but yeah, so yeah it, it it was a shame for Snowden because like i said he was on for a good race he was having a good race he was in the points you know he was he was he was holding up um I, i'm sure he was holding up one of the merch i might be getting that confused with Cassidy, so i know he was holding up hamilton for a while um but but you know he, he was you know he was driving well he put in some good overtakes because he put in one not long after Gasly put in an overtake towards the end um but yeah it's just a bit it's almost sort of a bit sour at the minute for for Alpha Tari. Yeah, it was a shame um, for Yuki Tsunoda. And like you say, I would be very surprised if there isn't something at least publicly said by the FIA ahead of Canada. Because like you say, we can't have you know cars put in themselves in a safety risk like that. All it would have taken was just you know a bit of tape to get caught by some wind and it just comes off. And then you know the wing itself was unstable in itself, hence the tape. But um, Sophia, looking at Mick Schumacher then, P14 was certainly better than P20 where he started, but then obviously you've got to take into account, you know, um, everyone that was failing to finish ahead of him. Just a quiet one from Mick at the end of the day. Yeah, I mean, he technically finished ahead of Kevin Magnussen, I think, for the first time this season. So <laughs> do what you want with that information. But um yeah, another very quiet race, similar to how it was with Zhou Guan Yu. As soon as Kevin retired, it was like, oh, where's Mick? What's happening? Like, that's the only time my focus kind of went to Mick. He was just like in the middle of nowhere's no man's land. Like, he was about 20 seconds out from either driver behind him or in front of him when everyone was pitting and everything. So <laughs> he didn't crash. He didn't spurn. He didn't run off the track like, um, Seb Vettel did. It's just a quiet race. Um, P14, I think that's his best finish, or I think I think he finished P12 or P11 another race, but a good finish, albeit we had five DNF, so not the best, but again, we, we need to see him pick up as well. Um, we, we said this before, Gunther is giving him a warning as well after Monaco. We need to start seeing where this, where the F2 championship uh, champion comes from. Like, he did so well in F2, and he's just not settling into F1 as well. And especially, like, you have Zhou Guan Yu, who's been doing quite well in his rookie year, outpacing in his rookie year compared to Mick in second year. You have Yuki Tsunoda, albeit had a crazy first year as well, but is actually doing better than Mick. Again, different cars, but still, it. we need to start seeing more from him. And again, I, I kind of hope, Maybe Canada might be a change or Silverstone um, has to bring in the new components, I think, for Silverstone at the earliest. So that also might give him a bit of a push to try to get those points or get close to the points as possible for the next couple of races. Yeah, absolutely. I think I've got nothing in my notes whatsoever about Mick Schumacher, um, which is less than I'm going to say about um, Nick Latifi, uh, Joad, getting a... 10 second stop go penalty because his mechanic pushed him backwards a bit after the, you know, two minute warning, um, getting a five second um, time penalty and a penalty point for ignoring blue flags for half a lap. What was going on with Nicholas Latifi today? 
<laughs> or this season or for his entire career. Oh, it's uh, it's gotten to that stage where you just have no more words to defend the guy. Like I thought last year he might have turned, uh, and this is being very generous as well, mind you, I thought he might have turned a corner and um, was starting to score points for Williams and whatnot. And, you know, Williams themselves said coming into this season that, oh, okay, we're in a position now financially where, we don't need to rely on Latifi's cash. So he's got the drive for this season on merit. <laughs> That's not going to be the case next year. And whether it happens sooner as well, which is being talked about um, depending on who you believe and whatnot, but um, he's really not doing himself any uh, favors with his performances. Uh and yeah, you know, copying that five second penalty for ignoring the blue flags at the end too. I completely missed that when I was watching the race. Cause you know, after the stop go penalty at the start, you pretty much write off the rest of his race and say, look, you know, he's not going to come back from that. You know, he's been very prone to incidents and getting stuck in the walls and whatnot. Thankfully he didn't do that this time, but yeah, it was a weekend to forget for for Nicky and heading into his home race as well next time round. Uh, yeah, you'd hope that he performs a little bit better in front of his home fans. Yeah, I fully thought we would see at least one Canadian demolishing the castle in Baku today. We didn't. Um, whether that's you know disappointing or not depends on your view of the two drivers but tom let's look at the drivers who um did end up dnfing so lance stroll um the team talking about some weird oscillations with his car um by not finishing the race they can put in a new gearbox next weekend for canada might give him you know a bit more speed for his home race but ultimately nah. you know it's not gonna happen is it no <laughs> nah Anything of note from Lance Stroll today? Nah. <laughs> nah. Nah, just, nah, just. Should we move on? You did give him a bit of a ribbon yesterday. I've got nothing else to add. He's he, he's like a plank of wood. He just exists, but he has no purpose. Yeah. Um, you know, it's just, it's just there. Yeah, I mean, yeah, he didn't just... do anything today. Didn't no, uh, uh, yeah, and uh, yeah, I, I understand why they retired the car because you know, the oscillations from the Pope thing. Much like Mercedes, I think it's going to be an issue next week as well because Canada has some very similar characteristics to Baku, you know, certainly sector sort of, you know, certainly sector one and three from Baku. Um, yeah, so yeah, just, yeah, stroll. Okay, cool, moving on. Yeah, moving on to Sophia. Um Kevin Magnussen made a couple of good passes. You know, he got past the Williams and um, then obviously he got hit by the um, reliability issue. Yeah, another Ferrari engine. Um, didn't really see much. There was a few battles like around P11, P10, as I mentioned before with like Alonso and Vettel, I think kind of got into the mix of it. But again, it was very quiet. It was a weird race overall because... There was so much that was happening, but there's also so much that wasn't happening. Like I, I've said, like it's an interesting but boring race because you you kind of expect, like obviously, once you see one or two Ferrari DNFs, you kind of figure, like, oh, will any other ones drop down? Which we have seen now with two additional ones. Um, but yeah, it was weird. And then obviously, when he pulled to the side, and then you just see a clip of the car just kind of like slow, like slowly starting to roll, and he's like trying to get the stewards and marshals to like help him like push this back up so to get the car off the track but i think that's the most entertainment i kind of saw through the sky sports commentary um, for kevin magnuson for this race today yeah it was an unfortunately uneventful one after um his overtake really joad um show Guan Yu was flying on his uh fresher tires and you know we saw him passing his teammate and he sounded absolutely gutted when the team told him that he needed to retire um you know obviously he was out of the points but given his pace pre-retirement um you know you could we could have maybe seen him fighting for um p10 at least ahead of his teammate um 
what did you make of um Guan Yu Zhou's race today? Whether you <laughs> I racing? mean even even just like finishing a race would be nice to see for him at the moment because yeah like his reaction of you know are you kidding me again uh it was one that you could feel uh genuinely you know that's the third time in i think it for the last four races that he's had a dnf and this time it was a technical gremlin they didn't say what quite caused the issue but you know given all the ferrari power unit um cars that we've had drop out of this race it wouldn't be surprising if it was a related problem but um i really feel for joe guanyu this season because they came in with a lot of question marks around them and also criticism because oh there was other more you know and this is coming from me who wants to see oscar piastri on the grid um but you know obviously uh guanyu joe got in ahead of him uh, but they just haven't had the opportunity to show what they have, you know, their skill and their talent. And we saw Bahrain, that was a great result, P10 for them on debut. But then since then, it's just been uh, lots of issues from the car and whatnot. So hopefully, you know, reliability can be fixed and then we get to see uh, him perform like, you know, we've seen or whatever glimpses of but yeah it's just it's a bit painful when you know you can do better than what the car is giving you at the moment but um you can't so you know that's uh and also probably the curse of the cars to livery that they put on the car as well this weekend i thought that was quite funny but uh yeah hopefully they get a better run later in the season then we can properly judge uh them as a driver in their rookie season otherwise it's hard to really make a good judgment based on you know retirements because of mechanical and technical issues yeah it is a bit of a shame today like like i said was looking strong um tom a driver who will be absolutely gutted with today's result you know it's very much put him significantly further behind in the championship now but Charles Leclerc retiring with what looks like what looked like an engine issue. Um, I've calculated that if we'd assumed that Leclerc would have finished the race where you know he started for the last three races, um, he's lost at least sixty three points. You know, and that is basically the the well, it was a fifty one point swing, I think it was that Verstappen's had in the last three races. You know, that just tells you, it just tells you everything really, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, man, I feel for Leclerc. Uh, yeah, he's not had any luck recently. He, you know, the um, you can screw the Monaco on, on the strategy. Then, you know, his engine going bang in Spain, his engine going bang here. Um, you said earlier, Rubes, on the live chat that this is... Uh, He's had four poles and not converted any of them into wins. Um, and yeah, it was a, I think it was a 55-point swing in Max's favour before today um, to tag another 25 points on top of that. So obviously, Leclerc got diddly squat. Um, not a good day for him. And it's, it's funny how the fortunes have changed because at the start of the season, I thought it was going to be Red Bull who were going to be having these issues all season long because we all know what happened in the first few races. Um, but they seem to touch wood. They seem to have got on top of their powertrain issues. And it's sort of, it's, you know, it's basically thrown a Hadoken and now it's Ferrari. You've got the, um, you've, you've, you've got the, you've got the powertrain issues. You know, all bar one of the cars that retired today were Ferrari power cuts. And they all retired with apparent engine issues. I think science had a hydraulic issue, but the point is they were all mechanical failures related to the Ferrari power unit. And it's just, it, if Leclerc wants to win the world championship, he needs reliability because he cannot win the championship by bleeding points like this. And I really feel for him. I don't think he'd have won anyway. I think Red Bull would have done him on strategy. Um, I think Max. I think Max would have done him today. 
Um, you know, Perez mugged him at the start as well. I practically leapt off the sofa when that happened. Um, and, and you know, I don't think Leclerc would have won. I know I said yesterday I think he'll win. As soon as I saw the start of the race and the gap and everything, I don't think he would have won. But I think he still would have absolutely been on the podium. Um, but to, you know, to, to see his day just quite literally go up in smoke like that, you could hear the disappointment in his voice. And I know people have to try and stay upbeat and try and stay sort of not calm, but you know, stay positive and you know, and don't come, not come across as moody. It's hard to be positive when you've had four pole positions in a row and you've DNF twice with mechanical issues and been done on strategy on you know on on one of them. So yeah, you know, all I can say is, you know, I can say about the Claire is just keep your head held high. But he's now third in the driver's championship. Perez has overtaken him. Mercedes are only 30 points behind Ferrari in, in the constructors. I did not think I'd all 30, you know, maybe 30 points and change. Um, I'm sure that um I'm sure I'm sure Ferrari on like 199, Mercedes on like 167 or something. It's something like the point is just about 30 points. I didn't think I'd be saying that this season. Um, so yeah, so Leclerc, you know, he is world class. There is no doubting it. I was a little bit sort of skeptical at first. I thought maybe he's coming too soon. Boy, if I ate my words. Um, you know, you know, yesterday he he proved, um, you know, he, yesterday he proved just how good a driver he is with that pole position lap. You, you know, you know, anybody who listened or watched our um our quality podcast yesterday. You know how I felt about it. Um, it's uh, yeah, it was quite the lap. And as Jared has pointed out to me, Russell is only 17 points behind Leclerc. Imagine if you'd have said that after Bahrain or after um the second race of the season. You know, it's uh, yeah, it's just uh, you just Leclerc has got what it takes to win the championship this year. He just needs needs the reliability from his team. Yeah, he certainly does. Um. And Sophia, like Tom touched on it a little bit, you know, there's not really much more we can say about Carlos Sainz's race today because, you know, his car went bang after lap eight. Um, you know, he said it was a break by wire. Um, people watching and listening said it didn't sound like one. And, you know, they've said it was a hydro. They've said it was a hydraulics issue. Um, yeah, just, you know, and a, a very unfortunate day for Sainz that, you know, and ultimately a monumentally bad day for Ferrari. Yeah, I mean, I've I've said in predictions, I didn't think Sainz would be on the podium anyway. And kind of couldn't have seen it even in the first lap as well, in the first turn, he was quite slow. It, it was to the point that Max was very close to overtaking Sainz in that first turn um, on the start. So, yeah, I mean, watching back the clips and hearing it, it, it was weird. Um I can see why it could be like uh, the snap or it could be like the hydraulics. Probably something's going to be re- announced maybe tomorrow or next couple of days once they kind of investigate it a bit more. But God, Ferrari, it's like they're going back. <laughs> like we thought after testings and the last, like the first couple of races, like they were doing so well. And then it's just slowly like trickling down. Like it, it's Ferrari's world championship to lose. It's like, they had such a good gap and they had such a good lead specifically for Charles and even the constructors. And now it's just slowly, slowly slipping away from them. And it all comes down to reliability. And that's something that's been key, even mentioning in testings for all teams and all engine suppliers and everything is with new regulations and new, um, yeah, with new regulations, reliability is probably going to be the biggest thing for the teams and then also playing to the fact the cost cap as well the cost of all these engines and uh the time it takes to develop these engines and try to fix these problems we've seen uh teams already saying that they want to increase the cost cap or get rid of the cost cap uh this season which i personally think is not it, it's disrespectful to other teams who have like paced the money around like Haas, for example if they were to get rid of the cost cap now Haas would be screwed because they've invested so much money 
for down the line because they've kind of budgeted it for the year. Whereas you have teams like Ferrari, Red Bull, who kind of gone like willy nilly and just invest as much as they can. Aston Martin, for example, as well. And it's just unfair for the other teams. But Signs, I feel for him. But I didn't think he was going to be on podium. I think he was probably going to stay P4, or P5, um, in all honesty, or maybe have an issue by a crash or a turn because he's very close to the walls in qualifying and in free practice. So it might have been inevitable if something would have happened to him. But yeah, just not the best state for Ferrari overall. Absolutely not. And I do, I completely agree with you over the cost cap thing. You know, if they were to remove or at least raise the cost cap at this point, you know, like you say, it's just not fair on the teams that have, you know, committed to working to that cost cap. There's a reason as to why it was introduced in the first place. Don't just get rid of it now. Like, I get it. Like, things have become more expensive, fuel costs, salaries and all that. But other teams are making it work for them. And they're the teams that didn't have money to begin with compared to the other teams. So I think it's just because the bigger teams who have had like almost this unlimited budget now having to hold back is proving that money does talk even more. And it shows how much of a car is needed in order for them to win compared to driver experience and speed. Yeah, absolutely. Well, we've gone through the finishing slash DNFing results so far uh, for today. Um, let's uh, discuss our drivers of the day. We've already had a couple of you know names dropped into the hat. Um, so let's start with you, Jawad. Uh, who's your driver of the day today? Uh, I've got to go with hard to go past uh, Lewis Hamilton's performance. So a uh, solid day for him and given all the struggles that he was having through the race with the bouncing issues and whatnot, like I've seen uh, on Twitter, people compare it to the drive, uh, you know, some epic drives in the past from, you know, let's say Senna with the the gearbox and having the cramping, the way he got out of the car, that's kind of how Hamilton got out of the car as well after this one. I can fully understand he'd be so exhausted. So good on him for finishing fourth. And it was quite entertaining as well to see him do some overtakes. And hopefully we see this sort of motivation from him for the rest of the season, because yeah, he's not going to be fighting for a world championship or even race wins every weekend. But, you know, like we've discussed before, you know, it's about helping the team at this stage and making sure that they can finish in, let's say, second in the championship, because that does seem very realistic after this weekend with Ferrari's performance. Yeah, absolutely. Tom, who's your driver of the day? Uh, I definitely agree with Tom that Hamilton is the driver of the day for me. Um, yeah, I, I, I said it. I said it earlier that um that I thought uh, uh, that, that I thought it was Hamilton's best drive of the season aside from Spain. Um, so yeah, so you know, given the given the discomfort and everything aside from that car, yeah, it's Hamilton for me. Yeah, uh, Sophia, are you going to follow the trend or are you going to uh, go for someone else? I'm going to go for somebody else. Um, didn't really see much of them. But had some great saves. I say Sebastian Vettel uh, started P9 in qualifying, finished in P6 with a spin out, which that recovery was quick and only lost six, six seconds at the time. Um, so, yeah, um, I think he is one of my drivers today. There's a few other ones as well, but I think Vettel for an Aston Martin that's not been doing well, he's been my driver of the day. Yeah, um, I, w- I'm i going to give it to Hamilton, but I also do want to, like, say, you know, that Max Verstappen, I think, for the comfortable, like, race that he had, you know, he was in pretty much total control of everything today. Um, you know, just, you know, other than actually being able to get in a fastest lap at the end and, um, you know, starting P3, it was also a good race from Max. But ultimately, you know, I agree with everything that everyone's just said, um, despite Sophia not going with the trend. Um, <laughs> you know, Lewis did put in a stonking performance today and hopefully, you know, he can um, keep some momentum going and, you know, who knows what could still happen. But at that point, it's time to give you guys an opportunity to promote, um, you know, where you've come from. So, Jawad, we'll start with you. Hit the apex. 
give us a little bit about it. Yeah, so I host this podcast called Hit the Apex on my own, mainly doing race reviews these days rather than uh, doing something every week like I used to, just a lot easier. So I'll be doing a Azerbaijan race review this weekend. Oh, sorry, not this weekend, um, this week coming up and then talk a little bit about Canada. I do like discussing uh, the V8 Supercars Championship as well and some hot takes on IndyCar and and maybe even Le Mans this week as well. So yeah, check it out on the good podcast platforms such as Apple and Spotify, Google, YouTube and all that. So yeah, and also on Twitter, the handle is at Hit the Apex Media. Awesome. And we've got Tom and Sophia, both from Everything F1. T- today, we're going to get Sophia to give us the uh, little bit of the elevator pitch. <laughs> yeah, so you can find myself, Tom, and many other members of our team on all social media. So Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, we are on TikTok, uh, YouTube. Our handle is either Everything F1 or Join EF1. We also have a website that we post articles daily, not just F1, but F2, F3, Le Mans, opinion pieces, IndyCar, um, that gets posted two or three daily content all the time. And we do have a weekly podcast that we record live on a Tuesday night um, on Facebook and on YouTube that gets released on to Apple, Spotify, any streaming sites on Wednesday. We've had some great guests. We just recently had W Series driver um, Bianca come on. We've had um, Callum Eilat, Sean Kelly, just name a few if you want to listen. Um, and our website, um, previously mentioned, is www.everythingf1.com. And I think that's it. <laughs> yeah, I think that is a good amount of promo. Um, and if anyone wants to follow me, uh, I mostly just, you know, host this podcast. But you can also find me on the socials at Rubes, R-U-U-B-E-Z. And if you're looking for me on Instagram, put a 001 on the end because someone got there first. But on that note, Grid Talk is available on YouTube where most episodes are recorded live. If you're watching the stream right now, We'll be doing a bit of a post-show afterwards to just discuss the things that we missed and maybe answer some questions. But as we are also available as well on Amazon Fire, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Music, Verbal, Omni Studio and Pocket Casts. Just search Formula on Grid Talk for our huge back catalogue of shows with previews and reactions to qualifying and, you know, like today's race results. Please consider supporting the channel on Patreon so we can get mics, lights and better recording equipment. You can get your hands on some official Grid Talk merchandise on f1chronicle.com forward slash store. And don't forget, we do have a competition running. If you leave a five star review on Apple Podcasts, you'll be automatically entered into the running for some of our champion T-shirts. Also, make sure you subscribe to be the first to know when each new weekly episode is released. We'll be back soon with plenty of more F1 content. Thank you very much, everybody, for joining me. Thank you. Thank Thank you. you very much for everyone that's been listening. And goodbye. Ah, so now that that has stopped, we've had a lot of interaction going on in the comments, Woo! which uh, you know crazy. I'm looking forward to getting down with. It's cray cray. Oh, I feel old already. <laughs> <laughs> so Ruby, how old? Ruby, face. how old are you? I'm only 26. <laughs> yeah, I'm older than you, so. <laughs> yeah, but you know, you use the slang of the youths. Yeah, <laughs> I, yeah, I did have to Google what cray cray meant when someone first told me mine. Cray cray. It's not um, you know, like Crayola crayons. And stuff. <laughs> <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, um, I used to eat crayons. Eat. <laughs> I used to eat crayons as a kid. It explains a lot. But as long as you weren't sticking them up your nose, so that you start saying library and stuff like that, um, <laughs> trying to mimic Homer Simpson and stuff. <laughs> but uh, yeah, oh, let's. Didn't. Let's get started on some of these comments. So, Connor Walker. Hey, Connor. Um, Yay, nice I do be there. <laughs> <laughs> I know. It's always a disappointing day when we don't see Connor. Um, I know. It's, it's crazy how much of a well-oiled machine the Red Bull organization is and how Ferrari seems like it's a small team fighting for their lives at the top. But in reality, they're a historic team. Um, yeah, like I think yeah. you touched on this a little bit, um, Tom. Like, you know, Ferrari are just, they look like they've got no idea what they're doing. 
sometimes. They look like, yeah, they look like a team that's almost forgotten how to win and be in a championship fight. Is this just the first time they've been in a real championship fight since, I could say, 2012 um, with Alonso? Um, or sort of like as a team with like a genuinely good car? You're looking what, 2008? Yeah, um, I mean, there was obviously 2019, but that wasn't necessarily like legal <laughs> or like consistent. Yeah, mm. I, 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 just, I just like, you know, 2017 through to 2019, you know, Ferrari had some good results. You know, they had some propositions and had some wins and all the rest of it. But it, it was a bit like sort of breadboard in that period, where it's like they were there and they were sort of like, you know, you know they're picking up the odd thing here or there, but it wasn't like we were going into the season thinking, Oh, 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 sorry, it wasn't like we were going into each race or each qualifying or whatever, thinking, oh, who's going to get pole? Is it going to be the Ferrari driver or is it going to be the Mercedes driver? You know, they, they weren't... There wasn't, like, this feeling of... It wasn't like how it felt in 2021, where it was like, there genuinely is a team that is fighting for both championships. Um, you know, you know, for, for me, that sort of period, unfortunately, was when Seb was there. You know, unfortunately for Seb, I mean, um, that it, it felt like it was them sort of just like almost picking up the scraps and then finding some races that suited them. But then obviously 2019, they had the somewhat dubious engine. Um, you know, you know Rubes, you said it was well oiled. That 2019 was definitely very well oiled, especially know, with the few. Connor said it was well oiled. But... Oh, sorry, it was Connor who <laughs> said it was well oiled. Yeah, well, well, um, if you, if you look at the smoke that came out the back of Leclerc's engine today, it was almost too well oiled. Um, <laughs> you know, so, uh, yeah, so, uh, yeah, I, I mean, for our, you know, a team that's got as much racing history as they have, um, it's on, it is like they've forgotten how to win. And yeah, Connor's absolutely right. It's just, it, it's sad to see. Well, I say it's sad to see, you know, you know, it's like, I don't want to see a championship decided on reliability. I want to see a championship decided on on track battles and not safety cars. Cough, Abu Dhabi. Um, you know, admitted it. I'm, I'm, I ain't mean <laughs> anything, my friend. Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, no, no, you, you, you know, but you know, but I don't want to see Leclerc lose his championship because his engine keeps blowing up or his gearbox goes down or his hydraulics go or whatever. It was like when when Hamilton had that um engine failure in Malaysia in 2016. Malaysia 2016. Yeah, you knew exactly what I was going to say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, he did also have plenty of chances that season to win the title because you know, because he had a load of terrible starts and the rest of it, but you don't want to see something like that because it's not. It doesn't feel right, and I do hope Ferrari can get on top of it. This all this whole reliability thing started when they brought that upgrade in Barcelona, because Leclerc had the upgrade and Sainz didn't, and it's since then that the reliability has gone to absolute. Yeah, it's quite literally exploded. So, uh, yeah, quite literally. Uh, yeah. Going to take another question from Connor. Um, is it possible we are seeing the beginning of a period of dominance from Red Bull, similar to the Mercs with Nico slash Bottas and Lewis? Um, we've obviously seen Red Bull dominance in the past, um, namely between 2010 and 2013. Um, but, you know, this is the first real, like, look of potential dominance in the turbo hybrid era. Um, I'll open the question out to, you know, anyone that's actually wants to answer it, I guess. <laughs> Well, it's like it it was a bit of a shock coming into this season, especially after how much Red Bull invested in 2021 and the title fight uh, with Mercedes that they were so strong. Like it was a bit shaky with those first couple of races and the reliability problems. But, you know, going back to what, you know, Tom was saying about Ferrari and the fact that, you know, it's so long ago that they last won a title and it's like they've forgotten how to win. Red Bull haven't had that. You know, they their last, you know, dynasty or, you know, era of title success wasn't too long ago. And, you know, they've made changes within the team, but they've kept a lot the same still. You know, they've got Christian Horner there at the helm. You've got Adrian Newey as well so and then you've got a driver like Max Verstappen once in a generation type so I reckon definitely they could be going into a period of dominance but it's it all comes down to 
the competition around you. And that's why that's where Mercedes went unchecked for eight years. Um, Red Bull as well in that time uh, when they won four on the bounce, there were seasons where there were no teams that could really sustain a championship battle or, you know, could beat them week in, week out. And it's the same so far this season. I mean, yeah, Ferrari hit the ground running, but what does that mean when they've been hit with so many reliability problems? But not even that, they've had, you know, they were red-faced with their strategy in Monaco. The drivers are making mistakes as well, like we saw in Imola and then Leclerc, uh, sorry, Science in Australia as well. So it's as a whole team, you know, you've got to be able to, succeed and that's where teams like mercedes and what what we're seeing with red bull as well uh they are just a well-oiled machine and so definitely when you put in that performance across the board you're surely going to see some dominance from them yeah absolutely um sophia you looked like you might have wanted to say something there which is why i was just hanging on a little bit I'll catch the next question. I think um, Jared's pretty much said everything that I was pretty much going to say. Awesome. Well, we've had two comments from SHT. Uh, I'm glad Alonso is now on a streak of three point finishes in a row. Some Alpine yeah. fans have too high expectations. I feel they should take this good results. To me, as long as Alonso and Ocon were in the points, I'll take it 100%. Um, I mean, my my thinking with Alpine is you, you have Alonso and especially, I don't I personally didn't think he was going to do as well as he was coming into F1 and with the likes of Piastri who won F3 and then F2 back to back and is now like in the wings I was really hoping to hopefully see him a bit more this season or even like have a contract for next season Alonso's um, Alcon's contract is until 2024. Alonso's one is entering this year, but with how well he's performing, I can see his contract being renewed, which is a good thing in some sense. Still keep the streak live for the longest career in F1 um, as of today, but it also hinders the ability for younger drivers to get the seats that is needed. Um, you see so many good young drivers who are now having to go to different disciplines because you have people that are staying a little bit older, longer than expected. Um, for a team, though, I've been doing well um, with getting the points as needed. I think it's great, given that they have not had the best seasons in the last couple of years. But if you break it down to drivers, it's weird because it's a double-edged sword like you're happy for the team you're happy for Alonso as a driver and everything with the world championships um that he's had but then it also hinders not seeing new talent come in yeah absolutely like that's something that I was saying about you know Kimi Raikkonen being in the sport for as long as he was um Fernando Alonso when he said he was coming back I was like why you've done you know Alon- yeah. Alonso's got a year and a couple months over Kimmy as well. I think Kimmy's like the third longest or fourth longest career, and Alonso's still going. And Alonso even said he would love to stay for another two, three, four, five, even six years, which I don't see that happening with his age and just it, it, it hinders people. Um, even this season as well, you have Felipe Dragovic, who is a big lead in F2 winning four podiums uh four wins and two additional podiums in five races sorry in seven races like there's such amazing talent and i guess people don't want to see alonso go but at the same time you need to change pace and get some new people in Felipe Matt is coming back next and then it's Nigel Mansell and then um (laughs) i hear so jackie Jackie stewart Stewart? himself up Uh. abu dhabi (laughs) martin brundle as well maybe too bad you know i I'd rather see more of Martin Brundle, but like, you know, I think he's happy himself when he's doing his driving with his son at this point. Oh, yeah. Um, Alex did quite well with Le Mans because he was driving uh, Le Mans this season as well. Well, this weekend. Uh, so we've had um, a couple comments coming from uh, Peter and Paul, uh, occasional um, presenter on this show. Uh, Sup, peeps, not a bad race, to be honest. 
Um, Ferrari, Q Stephen, A Smith, what can go wrong will go wrong. And, you know, that's absolutely true. Um, if it could have gone wrong for Ferrari today, it was going to go wrong. Um, another one uh, from Connor, a uh, bit more of a personal opinion, but for me so far, George has probably been the best driver of the season. Thoughts? Oh, I, yes. I, 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 was think, I was thinking that earlier. Um, yeah, he, he's been... Was it, was it, he's the only driver to have finished in the top five in every single race. Um, and yeah, and, and in, in a Mercedes that is not as competitive as his, as he would have liked, you know, because obviously he did that race in 2020 in Sakir. You know, if, if, if he'd have, if he did that race and King, Oh my God, this is going to be Mercedes. I can't wait. He probably jumped into the 2022 car and went, what on earth is this? Um, you know, so, uh, yeah, um, you know, he's regularly outscored his, you know, outqualified and outscored Hamilton. Let's not forget who Hamilton is as well. Um, you know, he's a, it feels like, you know, you know seeing Alonso and Vettel and Hamilton sort of in the, in the perhaps twilight of their career. Um, and then seeing, you know, Max Leclerc and Russell and Norris and Sainz, you know, doing so well. It feels like, we're sort of handing the baton over and the next generation is coming through um, or the next generation is here. Um, and, and yeah, uh, Russell is one of those and he's done some really good qualifying and, you know, and, and some good, very, very good race results in what is at most the third best car on the grid. Yeah, I mean, you know, he's currently P3 in the championship. No. Yeah. Is he P3? <laughs> No, uh, yeah, P4. P4. no he, he's P4. He's, he's, yeah. I would say he's a few points behind Leclerc. Yeah, 17. Um, I, was, I was just predicting Canada at this point if Ferrari goes <laughs> bang again, um, which, you know, I wouldn't want to happen, even for the sake of the championship. You know, if anything, I want it for the sake of the championship, Tom, I want it to be happening to the cars that are currently P1 and P2 in the championship. Um, Don't give me but, that. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no one believed that, did they? Um, comment from John Mims. Uh, just dropped in. Took me a bit to recover from listening to Paul the bitter the entire race. Um, do you <laughs> believe what Paul said about drivers being afraid to race Max? Um, no. I'll open this no. one out. I don't think so. I mean, <laughs> I, I think... To be fair, I think Max has actually kind of tamed down compared to his aggressive years over the last um, couple seasons. Um, I I don't know. I don't think I don't see like drivers like oh Max and just like kind of hide away. But like I also don't see Max getting his elbows out as aggressively as he has done with Lewis. I think maybe because the championship is quite open, where it's not just a single competitor; it's multiple, including your own teammate that it's not that bad we say that now but then obviously it might be down the line when it becomes a two driver race or three driver race um it might change a bit but for right now i don't i don't believe that drivers should be afraid to race max and i feel like max is also not driving as aggressive as he has been over the years so yeah um just you know, just on the back of that i i i agree with what sophia said I think Russell proved that he's not afraid to fight Max as we as we saw in Barcelona um, when he somewhat pushed him off the track. I mean, you know, I'm probably going to be biased because I'm a, I'm a Max fan, but it's nothing that Max wouldn't have done to someone else. Um, you know, especially if you look back to like 2016 when he was uh, pulling some very, very, very questionable moves. Uh, you know, moving under braking or the rest of it. You know, we heard how annoyed Vettel got in Mexico in 2016. Um, that got a bit spicy at the end. Um, I remember that one. So uh, yes, yeah, so I, I think I think Max has. I don't even know if like tame this word, but I think matured is the word. And I think we saw that. I tell you what, the sort of turning point for me was. It was Monaco 2018 when he put it in the barriers in qualifying, and it was like the third or fourth crash he'd had in, in a row. And that was what got in the nickname Crash Stappen, which at the time was more than fair because he'd, 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 he'd put an ambitious, to say the least, move on Vettel in China that year. 
collided because I remember Martin Brundle's commentary. He's went, "Oh no, Max, no!" And it was, you know, he, he was he was never going to make it. And um, and and you know, he, he just he just had a couple of smashes here and there. Ever since then, he seemed it was like I don't know if uh, you know I don't know if he's you know been talking to um you know, I don't know if he'd been talking to like a sports psychologist or you know or excuse me you know maybe just a chat with you know the Red Bull you know management you know you know senior management team or whatever but ever since then he seemed to sort of not calm down but he sort of just like eased off that sort of like five ten percent um and then yeah and and that, and then and then and then and then I think also with him sort of going into the title challenge last year I think that was when he I think that was when we saw like what Max is about and and um I think it also comes from his dad was a very sort of well you know we all know what Jos Verstappen's like but someone who doesn't get enough credit is Max's mum Sophie Comfort who was a very 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 accomplished carter and she had incredible um uh, she had incredible uh um, sort of like composure and racecraft and, and all the rest of it. So if if you if you ever see videos or read articles about when she was karting, and then look at obviously when Yoss was racing, you see both sides of that in Max. And I think I think his mother's side is coming out more now because he's he's effectively sort of like more composed or more more relaxed, if you like. I feel like based on, you know, everyone's perception of Yoss Verstappen, we're kind of glad that Max's mother's side is coming out a bit more. Well, yeah, um, because Yoss is an absolute nutter. Yeah. Um, maybe that's why we got some team orders. I, it's not. No, one, no one's paying attention to him, really. Um, and for some of it, rightfully so. Uh, comment from Nancy Hernandez. Hi, my name's Nancy. I'm a Mexican living in Barcelona, Spain. I've just discovered you and I like the channel. Thank you very much, Nancy. Uh, Welcome, Nancy. To have you here. Um, that may, that might be you. Might be the person that put us over to six hundred subscribers. So thank you very much. Um, question. Another question from John Mims. Um, I like Matteo. I think it's time for a new forceful voice at Ferrari. Do you think it's time to replace Matteo Bonotta? No. No. I mean, is this going to be another case of? Uh, football coach merry-go-round where you just sack another team principal which Ferrari have had uh, too many people go in and out the door over the last you know few years you had um, Maurizio Riverbeni who everyone thought when he came in in 2015 that this is the powerful voice that's going to get Ferrari back on track but then you know there was a divide that was created within the team and you know Benotto was kind of the person that um, the people within Ferrari were looking to to lead them and then now he's become the team boss and it's like are we gonna get rid of him too so it's nothing to do it's more so you know the whole team itself have to just sort their stuff out rather than um you know sack the guy at the top because you know he is doing a good job i feel they seem a lot more better in certain areas but then there's areas where they just look like they're the same ferrari they were five years ago ten years ago so yeah i don't think you know putting someone else in charge is going to make much difference unless it was you know a, a ross braun or a toto wolf but we know that's not going to happen yeah, and I agree. I think Mattia Bonotto has arguably been one of the best things for Ferrari um, over the last couple of years. The only other two great things for Ferrari in general have been, you know, bringing on Charles Leclerc and bringing on Carlos Sainz. You know, those three as a um, group actually end up making me want Ferrari to do better, mm. you know. And, and also, like, something that which is kind of anti-Ferrari in the sense that Ferrari is all about passion and the fans, the Tifosi, it's all very passionate. But having someone who is maybe a bit too passionate as the boss might be, you know, not a good thing like we saw with the River Benny. So someone with a cooler and calmer composure like Benotto who doesn't, you know, lose his, um, lose his cool usually, uh, is is pretty good and even after this race what he when he talked to sky um he didn't seem too flustered or like you know obviously disappointed but not you know like 
Toto Wolf style, uh, unbelievable, you know, with a Terminator look in his eyes. So, um, yeah, you know, if there's someone you need in this situation, it is someone with a cool head and that's not going to make rash decisions based on, you know, the results of today. Yeah, absolutely. A cool head is something that you do need in a team that, you know, has the entire passion of Italy behind it, you know. And Italy is not going to be happy with what they've seen, obviously, today, you know, the four of the five retirees, you know, being Ferrari-powered. Um, yeah. It's just not ideal for them whatsoever. Um, God forbid it happens in Monza. <laughs> oh, Jesus. They'd be rioting if, they, if, it, if it does. I know. <laughs> um, but I think, you know, we've reached a point now. We've um, caught up with the chat. Uh, that's a good time to call it for the live stream. So again, thank you very much to everyone that's, you know, engaged. Thank you everyone that's left comments. It's been great. Like, you know, seeing people, even talking with each other in the comments and stuff. Very nice to have you all. Thank you very much again to Tom, Sophia and Jared, you know, for joining me on the show and we shall see you for uh, the Canada preview tomorrow evening. <laughs>